week's cut. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode. Um, I've gotten a lot of emails uh, over the years from new knife makers with a lot of questions along the way, and uh, I tried my best to answer those questions as I could. It's it's difficult with, with everything going on with all the social media outlets and uh, DMs on Facebook and Instagram and emails, so I, I missed a lot of them, and I, I feel bad about that sometimes when they come up again down the road. Uh, so I thought it'd be good to to start out with a, a couple episodes just about becoming a knife maker. There's a lot of things out there uh, about knife making that, that are funny. Uh, being a knife maker is not an easy job. Um, there are much easier ways to make money out there in the world, and uh, being a knife maker is something that you really need to have a passion for to do well at. If you don't have a passion for it and you're not willing to put in a lot of work uh, that you don't get paid for, it's probably something you shouldn't do. Um, my good friend Charlie Mann said something to me a, a week or so ago that I hadn't heard. Uh, he said, what's the difference between a knife maker and a large cheese pizza? Is that the large cheese pizza can feed a family of four. So another one out there, uh, how do you make a million dollars making knives? Start with two million. So a lot of work. Make sure you're committed if you're going to do this. I'm still a a part-time maker. I I don't have the option of of leaving my full-time job. Uh, I run the family business of rental rental units. Um, uh, I've done that for the last 30 plus years. Ever since I was a little kid, I've been working on apartments. Uh, So that's really not an option. And and in a way that makes it a lot better for me and easier for me because I don't have the stress of the full-time makers. Uh, where they are constantly struggling to to keep up with, not all of them, of course. You've got some out there that that don't really struggle with keeping their their books full and their orders full. But there are a lot of makers out there um, that are open and and trying to make a living selling knives. First off, I want to say I'm not an expert. Maybe I could be considered an expert because I earn money doing this, but I am not the end-all, be-all of knowledge. Uh, there are hundreds of people out there, if not thousands of people out there, that know more than I do about this, about knife making. I'm going to share what I know. I'm going to pro- probably share some information that not be may not be 100% accurate. Uh, I would love to be told. I'm still learning every day. Uh, If there's something that I say that you don't agree with or you think isn't accurate, especially if you feel it might lead people down the wrong road, definitely let me know. I am not too proud to say I made a mistake and I quoted things wrong or said something wrong, so please let me know. This is how I make knives. This is my opinion, and that's all it is. A good place to start is uh, Wayne Goddard's book, A $50 Knife Shop. You can buy it online. Uh, I think Amazon's got them for around $13 to $15. Um, so really, I guess it's a $65 knife shop because you got to buy the book and then the tools to get you started. Um, that book will help you get the ball rolling. It'll give you something to reference to these days with, with, uh, the internet. That makes me sound really old when I say these days with the internet. Um, you can have a question about something and you can almost always find the answer. Um, which is a, a great help. Back in the in the early days, when there was no internet, you bought knives through catalogs, and makers learned how to make knives by mentors and a, being an apprentice and learning how to make knives from other makers. Uh, very difficult. You're already jumping in with a huge commitment at that point. The knife maker market is flooded right now with knife makers. You've got thousands and thousands of makers that are starting out making knives and selling them. Uh, by far most of them are part-time doing it as a hobby. One of the <clears throat> thing that's hard for full-time makers or some of them is that you get all these new makers, uh, all the information's out there. You can get going and start making a relatively usable knife within a, a year or so uh, if you commit yourself. And you're not trying to support your family, so the time involved in those knives is is not important to you. 
So you end up selling knives for $100 or, you know, $70, $80. And there's no way a full-time maker can make a knife like that at that price. Um, they can make a knife like that, but they can't sell it at that price. So it, it that portion of the knife market is highly saturated. So if you go looking for a, a custom-made knife in the $80 to $100 range, you'll, you'll find more than you can imagine. Uh, Blade Forums constantly has knives available from newer makers. Great place to start. You can get a knife maker uh, membership to bladeforums.com. Offer your knives up for sale. Uh, that's how I got my start. Uh, Matt Bailey was a big influence on me. Uh, he does the Hamones and, and the Rough Finish and some Damascus and the Two-Tone Handles. That's where I really focused on. I bought some knives from him. Uh, he actually made a design that I drew up uh, for me. I still have that knife. Um, so that's how I got started. And I sold knives for $80. And, and they were decent knives. Looking back on them now, you know, I, I would love to have all those knives back because obviously it's not my best work. It's early work. They're out there. I should put my dates on my knives because someone might grab a knife from the first year I started making knives and go, wow, Ryan Weeks really does suck. This knife's terrible. But it is what it is. So... I love those knives, and I hope that the people that bought them still love those knives. They got them at a good value, and, and that's what matters. Uh, prices go up as your skills go up. So, tools. You can make a knife with a uh, fire, some type of blower, uh, a hammer, some type of hard thing to hit the steel on, or you can even do it with just a grinder. That's how people start out, and it really is a good way to start out because you put minimal cost in, you kind of get the idea of the formation of a knife. Um, one thing I want to talk about is, is knife steel. Uh, the steel selection is really important when you start out. My, if, if someone asked me what steel should I start with, I know the answer I would give. 1080. High carbon. The 10 series steel, uh, if you're not aware, is uh, the last two numbers is actually the percentage of carbon in the steel. So it's 0 0.80 carbon, so less than 1% carbon. 1095, 0.95% carbon, so still less than 1% carbon. Uh, 1095 is a popular one to start with. It's an easy one to find. The problem with that, to get your full potential out of that steel, you need to have what's called a soak time. It needs to sit at 1475, 1480 for a certain number of minutes for it to get full potential out of that still. 1080 is not that way. You can bring that still up to temperature, bring it to non-magnetic, and just a little beyond that, and quench it. It does not require a soak. So that's why I say 1080 is an inexpensive still, easy to work with. You can heat treat it with a a torch or a propane forge and a decent oil uh, which I'll talk about in a minute so that's the still I would tell you to get um, so there's 1075 1080 1084 1095 w2 w1 uh, 15 and 20 52 100 uh, those are all high carbon stills uh, that I use but as far as the easiest still 1080 would be my answer let's talk about quenchants I started out with the good old canola oil. Uh, if you're going to get something that's easily available, uh, that's a good one. It has a high boiling point. Uh, it handles high heat really well. It dissipates heat fairly quickly. Uh, it's definitely not the best you can get out there, but I know a lot of makers uh, that use it and still use it after all these years. Um, for 1080 still, if you're starting out, it's perfect. If you're going to start getting into the Hamones or the stills to get a little higher Rockwell hardness, you're going to need a different oil. The oil I use is called Parks 50. Uh, it's a little hard to get a hold of. It's pretty expensive. You're looking at $150 um, to get five gallons of it, where canola is like $12 down at your grocery store. So I would recommend using canola oil. Don't use water. And, and one thing that people maybe are mis misunderstand is even when we're talking about water, they're really talking about brine. I imagine there are some people that use water. Uh, the potential of cracking still in water is super high. I, on occasion, 
we'll do a combination of brine with parks 50. So I'll do a brine quench for a certain number of seconds and then finish the quench in oil. Uh, if I do it in brine only, uh, I've got about an 80% failure on that quench. Um, so canola oil is what I would recommend. Another interesting fact is some of the some of the steel out there, you get a lot of information from the name of the steel. W1, W2 are tool steels. The W stands for water quench. So that means that you are able to do a water quench with the W steels. Uh, that does not mean it's easy. That does not mean it's not going to crack. There's a lot of factors that you need to learn and play into it before that becomes an, uh, uh, something that you can do on a regular basis. I am not at that point. That's why I do a brine and oil quench. Uh, O1 is a tool still. It is an oil quench. That's what the O stands for. Um, a lot of your drill bits and things like that are made out of O1 tool still. Um, I'm not a big fan of O1. A lot of people are. It's a good still. Uh, the reason I'm not a big fan of it is I get a lot of rust when I use O1. Uh, so I, I tend not... To, and, and W2 and 1080 and 1095 and all those, those will rust easily as well. But it seems to me personally that the O1 rusts a little easier. Um, so I've avoided that. Uh, plus you can't get homones in it. So that's another reason I don't use it. Let's talk about homones. This is a skill that, that you probably ought to hold off doing until you've got a regular heat treat um, figured out and worked out. Uh, the stills that will take a good homone are 1075, 1095, and W2. And I've been told W1. I've never used W1, but a lot of people get good homones out of that. 1084 and 1080 will get a homone, but I have not gotten the activity out of those two steel uh, types as I do the 1075, the 1095, and the W2. Um, so uh, t if, you're, if you're working with 1080, you usually can get, once you've got your heat treat down and you start applying some clay and trying to do homones, uh, you can get a straight line homone, which a lot of people like. I personally like the fingers and the activity in the homones. Um, so that's, those are the still options. So if you're working with 1080 and you progress to the point that you want to do a homone, you can still use that still and work on your homones. Um, and, and it should be a fairly fluid movement over to the homone game. So, all right. One of the other things that you're going to need to get, and I think that probably is the most expensive thing. Uh, starting out that you probably should invest in is a good drill press. You can drill the the pinholes out and some weight reduction holes with a hand drill. Uh, you're just not able to get the squared up straight holes that you would get with the drill press and that causes problems during the handle construction. Um, so you can buy a, a fairly inexpensive tabletop drill press. Uh, you're looking around maybe $200 so that's not part of the Wayne Goddard's $50 knife shop uh, tooling but it's one that I would recommend you do if you can afford it uh, maybe make a few knives uh, you take that money and get yourself a nice nice drill press uh, really if you ask me it's something that you, you have to have as a knife maker uh, I have a craftsman drill press that I bought from I believe Sears is who sells craftsman uh, it was a not as cheap as that it's a full standing uh, heavy drill press that probably cost me five hundred dollars and I still use that one today in the in the seven or eight years I've been making knives that's still the drill press that I use uh, so you you want to look at, at getting a drill press the other thing that you want to look at getting is some type of steel cutter now the bandsaws that are out there and I made this mistake I went and bought a fairly inexpensive bandsaw from Sears uh, those are not made for cutting steel. They are too fast, and um, they just don't work for steel. So don't go out and buy a bandsaw made for wood. That will not work. Uh, I also bought a jigsaw thinking that I could make that work because, you know, they use a very small blade that's got fine teeth, and you would think it would cut steel. That was even worse. So, you know, I'm hopefully passing this on to you guys so that you guys don't make mistakes if you're starting out. That I did and waste the money. Uh, those things still work for wood, and, and I use them 
for my handle work. So it wasn't a total waste, but it didn't suit the purpose that I thought it would when I bought it. So the best thing that I've invested in as far as cutting steel is a portable band saw. So a porta band. They're little handheld saws that are made for cutting pipe. Plumbers use them. You can get it at Home Depot. Uh, DeWalt makes them. Uh, Rigid, I think, makes them. Milwaukee is what I have. You can also get a stand to mount it in. Now, I didn't use the stand, so I'll talk about it without it for, for a moment. I, when I started out, bailing wired the trigger on, put the bandsaw handle in a vise, made a little jury-rigged table platform that I could set my still on Perfect. and cut my still out that way. Uh, it worked. It was kind of hinky. Swag Offroad. Uh, dot com, I believe it's if you did S W A G off road, they make a mount. Uh, they're I think a, a Jeep and off road vehicle uh, modification company that that sell their thing to make roll bars and that kind of stuff. That's what it's for, uh, and it works great. I use it all the time. Uh, you are limited lengthwise. You'll end up if you're cutting something longer than seven eight inches, you're going to hit the back of that bandsaw and and be limited on the size knives you can cut. But you can. You can work through it. I, I cut out my vegan Crocs on that. It's a challenge. You're flipping the still in all different directions, trying to get the cuts to go all the way through, and it's it's a little bit of work, but it works. So nothing worse than trying to use a chop saw or a hand grinder to cut out the profile. Even worse, a hacksaw, a hand hacksaw. Uh, that's where a lot of makers quit, is they try to profile that blade out by hand, and it's just a nightmare. Uh, so that'll save you some time as well. Then once you've got it rough shaped out with a bandsaw or a chop saw, if that's what you're still using, or a grinder, uh, you can use files. And files work really well. Uh, that's what they're made to do. They're made to remove heavy, heavy material. Uh, put it in a nice solid vise, which is something you're going to have to get, a heavy-duty big vise that you can mount to a solid surface like a workbench. Um, and get one of the bastard big tooth files and contour that that blade out or that that blank out that's a lot of the work i mean getting taking a design that you've drawn up putting it on a piece of steel and then roughing the shape with files and grinders is a lot of work um, as you get better tools that work reduces and, and makes life a lot easier now this might be a good time to talk about forging forging is a good way to get your blade to shape without having to use the bandsaw or the files or all that kind of stuff but it takes a lot of work to learn how to forge plus your steel is no longer this nice squared up bar that you can get a center line on and everything like that so there are drawbacks to that as well some of the best makers are forging they're still the shape and you know those are the people that I hugely look up to uh, Nick Wheeler Mike Cuisenberry, Jason Knight, um, tons. Too many to mention. Um, I do something in the middle now. I will on my bigger blades that I don't have big stock for, like the Vegan Crocs or my Kukri's um, or the cleavers that I do. I will hammer those to rough shape just to get the steel wide enough and long enough and bent enough to fit my profile. And then I'll go back to the grinding and the bandsaw and cut it to shape drill the holes and try to get it back to square as I can. Um, so I, I, I do a combination of those things. I'm trying to work on my forging uh, to shape. So you can actually forge a knife to shape, almost to dead shape, where I mean you've got your finger grooves hammered in, you've got your blade down to an edge, and you can heat treat that, put a handle on it, sharpen the edge and have a functional knife. It won't be pretty. Uh, I shouldn't say it won't be pretty. I, I love that kind of a knife, but it's not a clean, you know, super pretty knife. It's a, a built for use knife. Um, as you know, there's filled grade and it, I think Jason Knight said that they call their lowest grade finish, the adventure grade, mm -hmm. uh, still a high grade finish when it's Jason Knight we're talking about. But anyway, uh, different grade knife so that's a good way to start getting a, a decent user knife all right let's talk about handles um 
first off, well, part of part of my handle building process is drilling the pinholes and weight reduction holes. If you've got a good drill press, that makes things easy. Um, if your steel is is not annealed, you're going to have a hard time drilling. Um, so uh, most steel that you get from the providers like uh, Aldo, who is the New Jersey Steel Baron, um, things you get from the knife materials stores online, those are usually, I, I haven't run across any that are not ready to drill and, and, and they're in a semi-annealed state. So uh, if you're careful and you're doing it right, you should be able to just use regular drill bits that you can get down at your hardware store and, and drill the holes that you need. I use the same pin stock to keep things simple. So I use quarter inch pin stock and eighth inch pin stock. So my smaller pins are always eighth inch. My larger pins are always quarter inch. I drill the holes initially uh, with quarter inch bits and then I enlarge them a little bit because you're trying to put a quarter inch piece of rod through a quarter inch hole. Um, if you make the hole a little bit bigger, then you will be able to make up for a little bit of your angles being off or uh, your scales not being exactly squared. Uh, that'll help a little bit in getting stuff through. So I actually use on the quarter inch pin stock, I use the F bit, the letter F bit. Uh, and it's just slightly larger than quarter inch. On the eighth inch, I use the number 30 bit, which is just a little bit larger than the eighth inch bit. That allows room for glue. That allows room for movement if your scales don't line up exactly right on both sides. Uh, helps greatly. Um, nothing worse than getting your glue made up, getting ready to put everything together, and you find out it doesn't get together. You've got glue everywhere. You start trying to hammer it on, your scales break. Happens all the time. Happened to me a lot in the beginning until I learned to get this to get the square to get my drill press squared, to get my material square when I drill the holes and oversize my holes a little bit. And I do that in both the tang and the knife handles. I will oversize both those holes. Um, it doesn't matter what size you do, the the weight reduction holes. I use a unibit, which is those step down bits. Uh, that the further down you go, the bigger the hole gets as it as it widens. Um, so that's what I'll use to get those out. And those are expensive bits. Those are about thirty dollars each. So you got to be careful with them. They do wear out if you're not careful. Uh, if you're heating your steel up and chattering, then uh, you're you're going to wear them out, and you're not going to be very happy because they're expensive. So back back to handle material. Um, I love wood. Uh, natural woods, koa, coco bolo. Um, those are two of my absolute favorite. I am allergic to coco bolo, but I love it so much that I don't mind. I'll still still use it. Uh, koa is is really my all time favorite. If you get a good piece of koa, it's really hard to beat. Uh, ironwood is another one that's really good. In those three woods, those three also usually do not take stabilization very well. So it's good to use that because you don't have to worry about getting them stabilized. There are people out there that say they can stabilize it and. And that's fine. It, it can't hurt someone to try to stabilize it or stabilize it a little more. Uh, what stabilization is, is getting all the voids and and pockets. If you think of, of wood like a woven blanket, uh, there are fibers and, and that's what your grain is. Those are different fibers and there is air space in there. Uh, as wood moves from climate to climate, if there's more humidity, that's going to absorb moisture and the wood's going to expand. Or if it goes into a dry area, say a Hawaiian maker puts a nice piece of wood on a handle and sends it to Arizona or Utah, that's going to dry out and it's going to possibly split. Uh, I did a lot of traveling as a scuba instructor, uh, and a lot of people would try to bring home wood carvings. Uh, you go to these exotic places like Thailand and Burma and, and all these places, and they go by these wood figurines and carvings, and they bring them home, and within a few weeks or a month, it's got a big split right down the middle or completely broken in half. And that's because the air has just sucked all the moisture out of that wood. So in stabilization, you're impregnating resin. You put it in a vacuum. It's a, a epoxy style resin that gets pulled into all those voids and presses out all the air and just fills all those voids. Um, and that makes it so that wood will not absorb moisture. So I choose to use if it's not the specific woods I mentioned, ironwood, koa, coca bolo, 
Um, those are very oily, dense woods that usually don't take stabilization very well. Uh, maple, uh, some of those other woods that are lighter um, have to be stabilized or you're going to have movement problems. So if you're starting out, I would recommend sticking with G10 or canvas micarta or any of the micartas. Those are very durable, very easy to work with. They will not move. Uh, very inexpensive. Uh, G10, you can get it off a knife supply. You can get a decent sized sheet of it for like six to eight bucks. Um, I always do three eighths inch thick stock because I like to do a heavy contour uh, on my handle. So I've got three eighths inch on one side, three eighths inch on the other side. And then I do some heavy contouring when I'm shaping my handles. A lot of people can go thinner, and I do thinner on certain style knives. My karambits, I will do a thinner scale uh, just because they tend to be concealed. Uh, you don't do as much contouring on it, so I'll do a thinner thinner material on those those karambits. I think that about covers the, the tools and materials. I didn't go through every tool you need and every bit of material that's out there. Uh, just to summer, summarize, as far as materials go, well, let's start, let's start with tools first. Mm -hmm. You'll need a good set of files, uh, some flat files, some rounded files, some half round, half flat. I don't know what those are called. One side's round, the other side's flat, so it's a half circle with a flat side. Uh, I use that one probably more than any of them. You can kind of get a dual purpose file that way. I have a lot of the small files to get into to different areas. Mm -hmm. You will need some type of way to cut steel. I would recommend if you've got the funds to buy a port -band, portable bandsaw and get a swag off-road stand. Lots of makers use them. I still use mine every day. Um, and a drill press. You'll need a drill press. So uh, those are the, the main tools that, that I think you'll need. All the parts that go with it, like the drill bits, and that is obviously something you're going to have to get as well. As far as materials go, start out with a nice piece of 1080. I, would start, I wouldn't start thin. A lot of people want to start with the uh, eighth inch thick. That gives you very little room to make mistakes. If you go with 3 16 I started out way thick. I, I was in the, uh, you know, half inch stuff when I started. And that is a lot of still to cut through to shape and a lot of still to move with a file. So 3 16 is a great thickness to start with. Um, um, 1080, you can get it at, at a, uh, almost any online knife still. You can even get it at the non-knife still. Uh, it's a little more expensive, like at Admiral and that kind of stuff. But uh, I would recommend, if he has it, I haven't checked his site lately, but Aldo Bruno, the New Jersey Steel Baron. Um, he has all the knife steels you need, um, and, and that's where I get almost all my knife steel. Alpha Knife Supply is a good one to get stuff there. Local here, they just moved back to Utah. Great people. They have great materials. Um, so they're another good one to get it at. Uh, Kelly Couples has 1080, and everyone talks about how great ten Kelly Couples 1080 is. I bought some a long time ago. It's gotten in the mix of my other 1080, so I'm not even sure which is the stuff I got from him and which is the stuff I've gotten from other places. But uh, 1080 steel. If there's anything you get from this as a new maker, start using 1080 steel. Um, we didn't talk about a, a lot of the forge uh, stuff, but I will uh, talk about it right now. Uh, you can use a torch if you do a smaller knife. You can use a, I prefer the map gas, which is the yellow uh, container with a, a torch. Uh, the problem with that is you've got to be really good about getting that steel up to temp and keeping it even. You're moving that flame back and forth across that blade to keep it even. You want to focus mainly on the edge. It's going to be a hard thing to get that whole spine. Some knife makers purely use the torch. Now, most of them go from a small torch to a, a larger argon. Uh, or is argon the word I'm looking for? Acetylene, sorry. Argon's for my diving. Uh, that's what I put in my dry suit. Uh, acetylene torch, and that heats it up a lot faster and holds a lot higher heat. So if you can do acetylene, that's even better. Uh, you can make a forge. Um, there's a lot of online uh, resources or references that you can take and, and make your own uh, two burner, three burner forge, or even a little one brick forge. They're all out there. So uh, have a look at that, see what works for you. Um, I still use my three burner propane forge that I made. Um, I also have an even heat oven. That's where I do most of my heat treats so that I can do those soak times I talked about. Handle material, <clears throat> I would say use G10. Hard to beat. And the epoxy I'm using is the uh, Acroglass. Uh, two-part epoxy. It's a four-to-one ratio. 
Uh, it's made for seeding gun barrels. You can buy it at Brownells. Uh, that's the stuff I use. And, and there was a big thing. If you want a, an interesting read, uh, look up Glue Wars, G-L-U-E Wars on Blade Forums. They did a whole bunch of testing. Uh, Wet, what's the other one that's out there? West Systems or something like that is another one that everyone uses. Uh, so those two are the most popular and probably the best options as far as durability goes. West Systems or Acroglass. And do not get the Acroglass gel. Get the other stuff. All right. Thanks for listening. I hope this helps some of you. Uh, to a lot of you, it's probably just old news and you've already figured out this stuff. But if I had had some of this information as I started out, I would have saved a lot of money and a lot of time. Uh, feel free to contact me if you have any questions or if there's something in here that you didn't understand. Uh, what I'm going to be doing um, in the next few weeks or month is I'm gonna start doing some work in progress. I'm gonna actually go through my process with video of how to make a knife. I won't use all the basic features we talked about. I'm gonna just show you how I do it. Um, hopefully that'll answer some questions as I go through that process and, and that should take a, a few episodes. Um, hopefully some people are interested in listening. I appreciate those that are listening. Uh, this is fun for me. Uh, I'm not doing it for any other reason than, than to maybe help some people out that are are interested in my work and maybe looking at making knives for themselves or their family members or possibly going on to making knives as a business. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, guys.